good afternoon, everyone. So I think the topic of our today in these days is COP27. It's talking about climate change and climate change on so many levels. So as a school of business, it is very useful for us to be part of this discussion and see a discussion of how could businesses treat off their responsibilities to various consistent constituencies and to the planet. So, and how to really structure the means to the um, voices of various constituencies and actually be heard by corporations. So, today we have the Harvard Business School Baker Foundation. We'll be discussing with new research that surveys people in 14 countries about their perception of the role of business. The 14 countries do not actually include Egypt as one of the countries. However, it would be very useful to see the reflections of other countries and see how similarities or differences are actually there in Egypt. So I think in the discussion over the QA, we can start reflecting partially on Egypt and trying to interact with presentations. We need to have your phones ready because you're screening QR codes and answer questions on the board. So as we go on, Thank you so much. I'm sure everybody in here can hear me well, but in case of the live streaming, uh, uh, if you can't, I'm going to send a message to someone around. So, anyway, I'm thrilled to be here. My first visit to AUC uh, and to talk about this topic. Now, this is an international business leadership series, and nothing speaks more about business leadership than the question of the need to watch from the end for what purpose. Um, and rather than this being a domestic, I apologize that we don't have the data from Egypt, it's been 14 other countries. This is very much a global presentation. This is brand new data. This has not been published yet. Um, so you get a chance to first look at, at some, what I think is pretty interesting. So, um, and as, uh, you said, you know, I have various titles at Harvard. I was also the scientist in school and built it. My previous, uh, well, my successor actually has spoken in this series, including interviewing you. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's get started. Uh, let's talk about the history of the role of business. And I spent, as I said, 10 years at Oxford. My college was a college called Balliol College. Perhaps the most famous fellow at Balliol College is a guy named Abbas. Um, and they, they might be familiar to some. He wrote two big books. One is The Wealth of Nations in 1776, but brother we written here in both sentences. In these two books, he captures the concept of business. One about competition, fairly traditional notions of capitalism, and then the other, through the moral sentiments, he outlines the duties that we owe to one another. This odd language he called it our, called it fellow feeling. So what are the duties we owe to one another? And at the same time, how do we run a competitive system? Those two ideas were the two kind of poles of his thinking, and he merged them together. This merging of these two ideas you know, held on for a long time. Um, Harvard Business School, their original motto is this, which is to teach people to make decent profits, decent places. I understand you're just moving from classes. So the, you know, the original model of Harvard Middle School with decent profits, decent. And if you think about it, the decent profits is really this book package. So decently is this book. And that was really the diagram of the first two decades. And then along came Milton Friedman in 1970, who told us, no, that's not quite right. It's the next question. And that was kind of memorialized by something called the Business Round Table. 1978, so incorporated into six, primarily the search Well, in 2019, they kind of went back to the old ideas. We share a fundamental commitment to all of our states. My uh, predecessor, you had both my successor, now you're going to my predecessor. He put I think, in particularly elegant way the purpose of business is to create profitable solutions to problems of the planet, not to create problems which they can help. And on the other hand, I am in the United States. Uh, our former vice president wrote earlier in the book, earlier this year, Walking Journal, 
the woke left is poised to conquer corporate America and set in motion a strategy to enforce their radical environmental and social agenda of the trade corporations for the free market that drive this truth. So, just to give you a sense, where did it start? Here? Sense of balance through much of the history of business? Not complete balance, but at least the attempt to find balance. An unbalanced view here. Tend to go back to balance, but an extremely polarized conversation. And who's weighing into this conversation? Economists, legal scholars, intellectuals, public intellectuals, and pundits, um, politicians, business schools, media, corporate titans. And what are they? The words are woke, capitalism, shareholder responsible, socialism, shareholder, stakeholder. You know, and it's become a very, very difficult conversation. So all I want to do in this presentation is say stop. Let's go back to first principles. And so we have another approach, a naive approach. We're going to ask our neighbors, those people in the street, consumers, employees, community members, investors, what they think in plain English, without jargon. At the end, we're going to have a conversation when you care about these results. But for now, I'd like you to listen to the results because they represent, and I'll tell you whose voices. Um, first of all, this is a research project that I've done with my colleagues, Dr. Suchu, along with the data science team and, and uh, thought leadership team at Edelman, which is a large market research firm. If you've ever seen the Edelman Trust, their barometer, um, they're the team behind that, along with many other things. So this is our team. It's a kind of strong team on both sides. And just in terms of process a little bit, uh, you know, what we did is represent some 14 countries, um, and those 14 countries have 14,000 respondents. This is the same size as the Edelman Trust. So it's neither bigger nor smaller than they're, they're re-weighted in the national representatives. Which countries, sorry, this is over like Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Japan, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, South Korea, UAE, UK. So it's a, it's a blend of countries around the world. Apologies, Egypt is not included, but your voices will come into this presentation because I'm going to serve a you before I show you. So the order of play, and I hope this is interactive. First of all, let's start with the old framing. Shareholders or stakeholders, would be. And then new framing. How high a priority should each of these groups get when business is big? Who wins? If interests conflict, whose interests should be prioritized? A bit of a reality check. That's about the who, what about the what's? How do we think about the relative importance of the economic role of the corporation, the social role of the corporation, and the chief political role? Two important parts. How is business doing? So we're going to start. And so you're seeing the question. So now is the time to get out your phones. Uh, so I'm going to scan that. And if you're online, hopefully you can do this too. Um, normally people say, put your phones away in a lecture, but at this time, get your phones out. Um, and you will see this question, which is the same question we posed to me. Which do you agree with for the primary purpose of the corporation is to maximize financial returns for its shareholders, not all of that possible? Or the primary purpose of the corporation is to benefit all of the stakeholders, all of that possible. So let's take a minute for everybody to kind of do that. Um, I have the most overqualified <laughs> assistant here. I'm happy with me. Uh, let's see what your results are. And then we'll compare those results to the results. So let's take two or three minutes just to make sure that everybody does that. Start to see how to do Okay. We lost connection. Yeah. Okay. Fine. It's all going to work, I'm sure. Get out of the way. If you're online, please do this too, because your voice counts every every bit as much as if you. If anyone succeeded in getting in? Okay, but we know that part works. Just 
Another minute or two. Excuse me. How many of you have put your results in? Okay, we have. Okay, I right, So 50, I, I do the math there. Anybody else? Yeah, 21, 17, Any other last minute vote? Oh, we... Okay, so this number, this is 20. I can multiply this number really easily in my head. All right, so. So uh, 20, so you had 17, which is 85% that said stakeholders. And 15% said I think that's more or less global average. How do you think that compares to global average? Because once I show you the results, you're gonna think it makes sense. You think the person on the street would be Higher or lower for shareholders? Probably it, it is supposed to be stakeholders. Well, it is 85%. Well, that's what you said. And it is right. It's right, of course. Let's see the, let's see the global. Across these 14 countries, 73% stakeholders, 27%. So I just want you to kind of focus now a little bit on the country there. First thing, if I had a really bad like mine, we just spent oh, pretty much the same thing. They're different, don't get me wrong. But it's not as if these numbers are wildly divergent. You might think the US is home of shareholder capitalism. It's not. Uh, kind of slightly below me, uh, or above me. So, and we think this is the worst question that we ask. Because what is a stakeholder after? It means everything, it means nothing. But the place to start. So if you think that you know everybody has kind of accepted the gospel of shareholder value maximization, I'm afraid the data is not very good. I'll show you some stuff that gets a little bit more to that. So that's just the place to start. Surprises, this feel about right? Do you think that your results for Egypt are representative of the country? Are you because you've come to a, a lecture by a guy who's talking about the role of business? You know, did I get self-selection in here and you're all kind of so Peter? I, I have a slightly different question, which is um, this is uh, for me is uh, what I expected okay. the variations of countries. Question is DNA of our schools, business schools, is not set for that. Mm -hmm. And to cross the divide and move from shareholders' interest to stakeholders' interest is causing all sorts of panic for everybody. Yes, that is our job. Your job as dean, my former job, my current job as professor, absolutely. But let's get more data, and then we'll figure out how complicated our job is. So forget about shareholders and stakeholders. You know, the question is considered more complex. What the question said, when companies are making business decisions, how high a priority should these expectations and interests of each to follow? High, medium, or low? They could choose as many in whichever buckets they wanted. Right? So not about stakeholders anymore, specific groups. Right? So you're going to do the same thing. And you should be able to pick multiple ones. So you don't have to just pick one, but who's in the high bucket? We also know who's at the low and medium, but I'll just focus on the high level. All right, let's take again, again a couple of minutes. No, 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 no. <laughs> we didn't see that. Yeah. 
don't have a lot of people. Okay. All right. So I need to calculate. So we have calculated, right? So let's just do two. It's great. So let's start with seven out of 23. No, it's 27. Okay, sorry. It's now moving. Eight out of 26. Eight out of 26. Um, so next one. Nine percent. Nine percent. Seventy-seven percent. No. Forty-six. 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 Right. So you would say, uh, would say most important interest, which is one inconsistent with your other results, but okay. Now we're at number one. Number one um, type of customers. Oh, so number one. And then next would come um, communities. Okay, that's where you are. Let's see where. People in 14 countries. Now, in every country, number one answer are two. If you teach marketing, this should be very reassuring. If you teach strategy, this should be very reassuring. Customers are number one. Number two, in, in virtually every country, and in some countries, number one is employees. Here are some of the country differences are the relevant. So for example, we often think Germany and France is way centric countries. And you see that, right? In France, there's no difference between customers and employees. And in Germany, uh, employees are a little bit on this. In every country, the answer is that. You said that owners and shareholders are co equals in terms of customers. Let's look at the differences. Let's pick the US 68% versus. To Notice that suppliers are the only thing lower. Well, actually, the suppliers and citizens. These are basically ranked the same as everybody else, which is below, well below employers, employees, and customers. What do you see up there? Anything else that's find interesting or provocative? Different, unexpected. 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 And unexpected. Unexpected, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, interested in citizen of the country. Yeah, so this is the kind of, so if you think about it, these are the two communities. This is where I live, where they operate, this is the country. And so you can see different levels of, as we're nationalism. Um, this is climate change, by the way. We'll get to issues in a moment, but when we talk about Future generations, that's all about climate change. No, I was just saying, I'm surprised that Canadians are not looking into the future. <laughs> only you know, we thought that this would pop up a lot more since I'm headed to Charles Shade for top. We thought that this thing would be way high. It's not, it's high ish, but it's not at the very top of the list. It's a much more nuanced view of what companies have to trade off. Again, you may not like this day. You can tell me why it's not representative. We can argue whether we should care. It's just what it is. It's well, let's look at that in every country. 
right? Brazil, Canada, not China, shocking. France, look at that difference in France, 60 versus 29. Germany, 20 points. India, five points. Japan, 20 points. Mexico, 11. Basically, Saudi Arabia the same. South Africa, uh, 10 points almost. South Korea, you can see it. Even in the US, my country. Well, points. 12 points is economically great. I noticed something else uh, regarding the future. Uh, the company that is giving higher percentage for this criteria uh, is the developing countries and not the developed countries. This is very strange. Yeah, so we're going to get to issues in a moment. Right? These are just, this is the food. We haven't got to the issues yet. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't check the economist in, in thinking of correlations and causation. Yeah. So, I, I build on the question that was raised here regarding the future generations. I was actually trying to see if there is a correlation between the countries prioritizing the future generations and the proportion of young people at risk. So I'm trying to think what are the common macroeconomic indicators or maybe socioeconomic indicators between the countries prioritizing the risk. So this is why for an academic as in mind. So one, there's only going to be 14 data points here. We're doing this now, we're going to tie that back to macro. Right? Yeah. But again, you know, at the very beginning, let's just get some facts because sh shockingly, these facts are not on the table. Let's, yes, maybe, maybe it's about people that, about the people that answer this. Sure, no, there's always a question about survey bias. Let me show you some stuff to suggest that maybe they're not based. They are nationally representative samples that I can assure you, um, stratified by income and other things. So. You know, it is a convenient sample to use kind of language, but it's been stratified. Let's take it. Let's make it a little bit more complicated. This one I'm not going to give you kind of a for, but we wanted to know if interests conflict, who wins? Because, like you, many of them put three, four top choices, but in the world, sometimes you can't make everybody. Sometimes interests have to be common. So the next slide, I'm going to show you who wins. Okay. It's simple as this. You can have conflicting interests and expectations. Which group should be a company's top priority? If, if you see somebody with shareholders, then that's a pretty indication that that's the military. I'm going to make it even more extreme than that. Right. So, and we gave them two outs, by the way. One is independence. Classic business school answer. Great answer. It's context specific. And we also gave them another how to answer. Not all these groups should be They should equally be considered. Think of this as the behavioralist one over N solution. Okay, so who won? Interest can play globally. Only 80% of people thinks that shareholders should be. And that number is pretty remarkably consistent across the country. By the way, you know, China. <clears throat> China's weird. We don't understand the results. This is mainland China. This is just Hong Kong. But these results, we are puzzling over. You know, like what they need. Whether they're telling us stuff in a, in a survey that they're not able to say in public. Because only in Hong Kong? Hmm? Only in Hong Kong? No, it's not Hong Kong. It's mainland China. Yeah. But mostly mainland China. Because I asked them the same question. Because it was just Hong Kong. It is special. How about the bid? This survey. How big? 14,000. So we think that the confidence band is just a confidence band. But you're not going to have a confidence band that's big enough to swap 20 down. That's not the band. I'm sorry, I stepped out for a minute. Maybe I missed it. Is this pre COVID? This is, no, this is this is a few months ago. A few months ago, so this is oh, okay. this is now. It wasn't last week, it was just a couple of months ago. Gravity field. Gravity field just recently, which I'm gonna show some of you on some climate thing. That just came out on Thursday. What surprises you? 
future generations. We want, you know, if we're going to be responsible business leaders. That, again, I'm just, I'm the messenger here. Right? <laughs> just giving you some data. But if you think about future generations, if you're future generations to owners and the communities. So again, when you think about, you know, what's your responsibility suddenly, what the market is saying, not the market, the consumers are saying, citizens, everyday people are saying. I have a concern here because I think that almost all of the suppliers are getting the lowest percentage, which is very weird because actually without the suppliers, you cannot even produce the product that you are giving to a customer. So we worry about the same thing. Here's our hypothesis. The suppliers are companies too. So you worry about customers in place, they'll worry about their customers. But we'll get, there's another, right, other observation. Yes. I have an issue about owners when you lump them together. Yeah. Because when you look at the way companies behave, if it is owned by a family and family is responsible, they have a very different behavior than when it's the ownership is very fragmented. And I, and, and I can show you more examples of this. Unfortunately, I just read the paper on this. So let me give you the date. This is not on the So this is probably traded firms with family owned. So the question here, so there's a different paper, different presentation, but I'll just kind of slip it in. We look at, and again, you may not like the measure, but various elements of ESG, 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 and the 10 sub components. We control for industry, country, size, leverage, uh, profitability. Um, and then we hand code the top 10 owners for 16,000 firms over, over 20 years. For each of the top owners, we identify whether it's a family state, whether it's an institution, whether it's a government state, um, whether it is a management state, whether it is an employee state. There's one group that consistently performs worst. Anybody want to guess what the group is? One ownership group that consistently performs worst. On ESG, on ESG, and on eight of the 10 subcomponents of ESG. Employees. Employees. So this is the employee owners. Who else wants to guess? The employee owners. Hmm? The employee owners. No, they okay, no, they don't. It's, it's at the very bottom, the worst ESG practices, worst E, S, and G, and eight out of the 10 subcomponents worst. Buyers? How many business owners? How many business owners? Family firms. Family firms. Family firms. So let me check this data over three years and three different data sets did every piece of time metrics we could. Family firms actually from our works. This is not private family firms, this is public trade. As Dean, this was an extraordinarily hard paper to present um, because they often are the kind of people you'd like to make nice to as Dean, but sadly the data is not. I'm happy to share this. Again, it's not about private firms. But this is firms where there's a family state and they're public. Okay, back to this. So it's kind of, you know, when there's a dunk ball, sorry, that's an American reference, but when there's a kind of a conflict of interest. Now, aren't these people crazy? So we needed to understand whether they were kind of just whacked out, you know, did they not understand what a business was all about? And so we asked them, why did you pick this group? For those of you who study John Rawls, kind of theory of justice, this is effective. Rawls, the distribution question. Who should get benefits and why? And so this is how they justified why they picked the top group. 31% because they're most responsible for the long term success. So they fundamentally understand the profit will purpose, get the profit. But then they're also saying, if you think of it, this is the impact that the company will have on them. This is something about, well, it's in the most effort, right? So that's a kind of a different Rawlsian principle. You should reward people who kind of work hard. They have the most power. They have the greatest need for special considerations so preference options before that's where that would fit in. Um, so we're trying to understand why they're saying this. There's a lot of reasons. But the dominant reason is because that's what's going to be in the best interest of the company. So 
again, it's a little bit of a reality check, but also let's move away from stakeholders to activities. We give them 15 different activities. And we ask them, do you consider the primary, secondary, or not a responsibility of the uh, Yeah. And so these are the 15. Again, it's too complicated for you to do the unmentable. Great jobs, safe and reliable products, drive innovation, go the economy, wealth creation, sign responsibilities, training to employees, local communities, trustworthy information, address climate change, pollution, poverty, address discrimination, promote cooperation, purely geopolitical, cultivate admiration for our country's values, punish countries that violate human rights. What about like, what do they think companies are supposed to do? Since I haven't told you. They clearly understand that the primary role of the company is to be a company. To do these things that we expect to create jobs and products, grow the economy, create wealth. It's the question on right, everyday people's minds that that is the primary role of the corporation. But a close second, this difference is not huge. It's all the social responsibility. It's not as if. This is the only thing that matters. In fact, if you look, it's pretty close. Where they do kind of drop off considerably, it's purely geopolitical. So we see companies as agents of profit, as well as agents of social change. Not we, person in the street. Again, slightly comforting because they're not crazy. By the way, we have looked for crazies, right? So we have enough questions. We've got 150 different questions. But we can identify people who are really polarized on one side or the other. For example, what does a pure Milton Friedman, Milton Friedmanite look like? Not only would they put shareholders first, but they'd also answer questions like, when standing up around issues in the public, who should we represent? And we have a battery of questions. If you want to understand pure Milton Friedmanites, it's about 4% of the population. We also looked at people who are pure kind of socialists, or I don't know what the right term is, but they didn't see the economic responsibility of corporations as terribly important. They saw it all as kind of doing social good. It's also about three or four percent of the population. So these extremes, which have largely captured the conversation, are vanishing in small parts of the population. The pure Milton Friedman view, you know, of this room, there'd be two. And the pure view that it's only about social stuff and forget about profits is going to be two of you. And that's it. Everybody else is in the middle. Seeing the importance of economic responsibilities is a close second on social responsibilities. Hey, I'm not defending Milton Friedman, but just so in old times when we talk about shared owners, they were in a good representation of the stakeholders. And they weren't changing as much as they are right now. I mean, when you look at the 30, 14 years ago, someone would own an IBM stock and would keep it for 30, 14 years. Now we're looking for people owning it for a few seconds. And this is what's causing the variance. This is what's causing the, the disparity between the shareholder and the stakeholder. But I think because even, even Freeman himself said that he it, it was, it was not defending it was Milton Freeman. He was saying that they, it used to be the same. Yeah. Or this used to be a good representation of this, but has drifted. They also tended to be more individual shareholders as institutions. Many of those institutions were not indexers, therefore just mechanically holding firms. I think there's a lot of reasons why perhaps the world has changed since Milton Friedman wrote its seventh work. Uh, all I'm trying to communicate here is that is not absorbed into the general population. It's not affect the contrary. It's seen as an exception. Minority. I know this is an off data question and you can't answer it, but if you looked at a timeline projection of the balance between the first and second, what would you say? What was, what's going to happen there? Is this the second one going to? Yeah. This, is our, this is our question. Right? So, you know, having done this once and this element to do it, we hope that we'll get to do it every year and we'll be able to get you a time soon. Now we do have a cross section. A follow up to John's question. Do you see a large variability across countries in these good sectors? Um, we see some. So those cross tabs are exceptionally complicated. 
Can we see some? But generally, no. Generally speaking, the societal responsibilities are a close second. Uh, the places where I think geopol geopolitical development jumps in the country. Obviously, there are some countries that are nationalist. Actually, I'm actually quite surprised that the, the gap is quite big. In fact, these are pretty hard questions. Yeah. You say this is an important responsibility of business, means you really are going to prioritize. I think I think slowest percentage because uh, its effect on the risks. If I'm going to have uh, some conflicts between my corporation and the government, for example, because they are not the violating human rights or whatever, I think this will definitely affect my business in the country that I'm working in. That's why I think its percentage is low. And actually, I was expecting a lower percentage. Um, we also have detailed information about around the Ukraine, whether they expect to speak out and how. Uh, we have detailed information on a bunch of very specific issues. And by and large, I'll put the slides out of the deck. Roughly 60, 70% of people in the CEO should speak on major policy issues, but not political issues, if you understand the difference between those two. The, the three for me are not very much separated. Like when you look, for example, about paid jobs, are those decent jobs or are they just jobs? True. This is one question. You look at the role of companies, again, in going to do political responsibilities. Private sector is responsible for modern day slavery. Private sector is responsible for conflict minimums. Yeah. But I mean, we talk about the, the person in the street, for him, it's just out of his, out of his uh, radar screen completely. No, I think that's fair. We, by the way, do have a detail for each one of these 15, so I could have shown that. But you're right. You know, this is safe and reliable products. We could have said, great, good jobs. Probably should have done that. But yeah, we did give them some opportunities to. For example, you know, one element of good jobs is training people. There will be some right. Mm -hmm. okay. And finally, one, some of the countries that are most promoting nationalism and adherence to their company to their country's values are also the ones that most violate human rights. So you've got a paradox in the last question. So again, first time we've done this, we can go back and do it again. In about 15 minutes. Let's get to some important parts. We need to. Oh, actually, for this one. Um, sorry. So, this question was, was really to understand what do you think the capabilities of business are in the So, if business devoted significant effort, you could have a positive impact on these things either a game changing impact, small model, or positive impact, or not. Again, too much, too complex to, to do in a little minute. Just to give you the answers. So between 20 and 30 percent believe that a business focused on big social issues, they can actually have a game changing impact on these issues. Led by wage inequality, perhaps not, not surprising, followed by climate change. So slightly less than a third said, you know, if business actually worked on this, they can have a substantial impact on inequality, wage equality, wage inequality at least, and the climate. And you can see poverty as well. They're all roughly the same. And they can have at least some impact on virtually everything. So again, in terms of test of reasoning, people aren't saying, oh, business tried to solve climate change. No. But what they are saying is if business put their mind to it, they can have a pretty substantial impact on these social issues. So not only do they think that it's business responsibility, they're actually fairly optimistic. And if we taught them, and that if businesses internalized those messages and they brought that into their businesses, they could fundamentally bring change to some of these. So that's again some sense of the expectations that consumers, customers, employees have of business and hence business. Yes. Peter. Corporations, companies are part of society. And this should help us understand that companies are lab for society. If we try and do what we need to change and support change in society, it can be a good laboratory and we can influence society for issues, among them these issues, I think health, wages, and a lot of things. Racism, for example, 
gender equity and so on and so forth. I think that's exactly right. And that's what the people who wander the streets are saying. Sure. Let's look at a report, couple of report card stuff, because we also have to say how well is company, how well is business doing? So, so far we said which stakeholders should be important, what issues should they focus on, but now how well are they doing? Two report cards. The first one is a report card on stakeholders. And again, I'm going to ask you help me here. So your business has a high responsibility. Where is it well meeting the needs of that group? Where is it underperforming the most? So why don't we just answer the where is it underperforming the most? Again, they had an ability. So again, this is a lot of different questions glommed together. But the way I'm going to glom it together for you is where they have high responsibilities. Where is the biggest gap? Where are they underperforming? So again, let's take a minute and then we'll look. One more minute and then tally up. Another quarter in front, person. And five percent owners are shares. Okay. So the way to read this is the gray bar is expectation, and the black bar delivery is the gap between them is where they're going. So the biggest group where people see underperformance is employees. Feel that the companies are falling absolutely short delivering whatever it is the responsibilities are supposed to. Secondly, it's future generations. There's the customers. Fourth, the communities. There's only one group where they feel they over index, which is they deliver more benefits than they deserve. <laughs> now, this is the only thing that's positive. Everything else, there's, you know, if we were grading them, it's work to be done, work to be done, work to be done, except in one area, which is the delivery of benefits to owners of the Yes. What is the definition of communities in which they operate? Because it's weird. The future generations, it's, 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 I understand that they feel that. So why the community, maybe the definition of it is in, in the questionnaire. It was that, that's why this pretty much this is the language we used. So it might have been misinterpreted, but that's that's pretty close to the language. In fact, that is the language. That is what we asked. So they would have to think, oh, like, where do they operate? So we don't. 
companies fail, the employees more than communities when in which they have expertise. So I'm not frustrated because I know you are so honest. The message company you are perceiving this. They're perceiving that companies have let them down. By the way. I presented this at a reunion at Harvard Business School about 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. And earlier in the day, my colleague uh, had presented a different piece just on the US. Mm -hmm. What they had done is they had looked at top management, middle management employees in terms of kind of satisfaction by employees. Top management thought that employees were very happy. Mm -hmm. Employees were very unhappy. <laughs> right? I mean, we don't have that kind of variation, but that was a kind of an interest. This is, uh, this is Joe Fuller. I don't know if it's published yet. So whatever's happening here is consistent with some other data, which employees feel, uh, no, I agree with that. I just feel weird that the community is just going over the public. It's fine. Well, in part because the expectation for communities is lower. So again, you can look at these bars, which is delivery, right? And so when your expectation comes down, the gap's probably going to shrink. It's kind of almost mechanical. Mm -hmm. All right, so now let's do the same thing, but without a survey. Um, now we're going to do it by issue. This is by stakeholder group, but now let's do it by issue. Uh, now I'm going to tell you in advance, by issue, the gap is going to be positive. It's going to be kind of there every year. So this is business responsibility, and this is business doing well. This is a pretty slide. Let's just read it. Place where they see the biggest gap between responsibility and doing well is work to solve major global problems, climate change, and poverty. That is the big failing that people perceive of business. Work to solve our country's major social problems. That's actually, when you ask it by issue, that actually pops up a little bit. Support local communities. This should give you some. So, you know, not saying local community as stakeholder, but local community problem solving that pops up, training these skilled workers, even human beings. I mean, it's just a second degree. The place where they see the smallest gap in here, because we're not saying stakeholders, we're saying should really create wealth for shareholders. Um, but it's the smallest gap we have ever. Yes. So this is a performance gap, not a research gap for the solve major problems. So with a 40% difference in performance gap, how do business schools improve that performance? And what do we do not to talk about it, to make the change, to change the time? I have particular points of view. We're going to have a discussion about that this afternoon. That's one really long question. Yeah. And you know, to be absolutely you know, honest about this, this is why 10 years to be dean was some of those satisfying time of month. Because, you know, a draft, you know, trying to focus school on these issues, that's, I'm not saying we did it, but this was very satisfying. Um, which involves, we can talk about those changing court curriculum, changing electric, changing, <laughs> mental, yeah, changing mental models, all sorts of things. Does it make sense to get their opinion about things related to governance, system, like government regulations, the rule of unions, yeah. the rule of civil society, and things like that. Because this is what really matters. I mean, what is the perception of what's this face between the private sector by itself is not going to be. There has to be regulations, there has to be civil society pressure. Yeah. Agree. So this afternoon in a different forum, I'm going to show some data about that with respect to climate. That's not in this survey, but specifically with respect to climate. Edelman, and I wasn't part of that study, but they've given me permission to show some unpublished results. Um, it's asking precisely the solution. I don't call sleeping jobs that that can't. We can restructure it downside. Really? Sure. But it's, it's still, you know, <clears throat> but we can all define about whether we think this is big or not. It seems pretty big. I mean, and again, I'm not showing you the, the data by country. So then we actually have to have a discussion. I think we talked about are they surprised? Honestly, should we care? Now let me start this conversation. I showed these results to one of my finance colleagues. His response was, so what? They don't understand how businesses work. They don't understand capital allocation. They don't understand why we need finance to drive innovation. It's very nice, Peter, but who cares? Then who cares I want in, right? Should we care? 
honestly should be king. I think most of the companies, or multinational corporations, they talk the talk, but they do not walk the world. Because actually, they are saying things, but they are not doing it actually. Because that's why we are seeing a gap between the performance and what they actually say. They can say whatever they want, but actually, uh, uh, in real life, uh, in practice, they don't do anything from what they are talking about. And in the climate day this afternoon, I think roughly six, two thirds of people believe that. Corporations will not pollute the climate. That's a concrete example. Uh, walking and talk. Um, I think if it's, uh, it's not going to care, we have challenges with existing things. New I have a question that I do not know the answer to. Is if, if we cared, we didn't want the people thought. Would make a difference. Well, I, mean, I, I don't know. I think we're all in education because we believe that that's true. <laughs> it is a belief. Well, we know that education, for example, leads to higher wage outcomes. That's pretty clear. Uh, we know that there's a correlation between various attitudes, say social connections, voter participation, other things like that. Um, that might not be causal, it might simply be an association because so. Don't know. But from a business point of view, I always care about my customer. I should satisfy the customer, which is true. So if, uh, if I consider the people as the customer, are the customer. I'm sorry, English was not my first language. So if, if I satisfy these people, would it impact my business and have a better result in my business? Maybe that what the, your finance friend was thinking. And yeah. You know, some pure believers in shareholder value maximization simply say, oh, all this shows is that. You know, when you take a long enough perspective, you know, if you help make everybody happy, of course, we're going to make so much sure we've got it. But, uh, you know, we have not, in this paper, because it's a survey, we can't show you a link between these activities. But, just presume for a moment that many of you think, yeah, we should probably listen to these things. How would we structurally build systems so that these voices are better? Not about the yes, no, like, what would you do? I think, first of all, we need to make, uh, to encourage those multinationals or those corporations to do this by giving them some benefit whenever you do this, you will have some sort of benefit because without having a, a clear actual benefit, they will never have a clue why, why, where is the benefit? And what kind of benefit do you have in mind? For example, like what you have said, uh, uh, it's improving education will give them more qualified people. Those qualified people will increase your profits. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, things like this, uh, uh, without having a, a clear actual benefit to do, to do this corporate social responsibility, they will never do it. Why? Why waste money and cost and time in doing something that will not return on benefit? Uh, actually, what's happening now is that uh, in uh, some countries in Europe mainly, uh, if you want to export uh, to Europe, they used to, they used to uh, ensure that you have uh, uh, quality certificates like ISO and uh, stuff like that. Uh, now they said, okay, you have quality certificates great for you. Now we want your sustainability reports. So uh, now it's becoming a rule and regulations to export to countries like in Europe to have a sustainability report and make sure that you have taken certain measures uh, in reducing your emissions and stuff like that. So I believe it should be something like that through your rules and regulations. Okay. Maybe you should go back to the business rules, the public of business. Okay. What do we do? I should do this about that. Okay. The I mean, there are rules and Daniel, for example. Daniel's yeah, right. The, the fabric came and he said that it has to be part of the DNA, he puts it in, et cetera, et cetera. But then uh, aggressive. Uh, uh, investors, uh, the role in ousting him, right? even though he was doing all the good things that you're talking about. Right. What's up? Uh, there is a balance. We I mean, had to strike the balance. He was trying to strike a balance toward the society and the other way. I think the world of money we cannot unite. We need to use the schools. I can give you many examples. With Oxford, for example, do you know who's signing money? I know Mr. Sayyid very well. 
They were talking about Hess, for example, they changed the name. This was a, a, a big slave, uh, one of them, I mean, big slave traders. There are many examples that are in your mind in all what we're doing, but we don't recognize that those guys are really violators in, in some sense, but they make the money. So I would get it. So those are some things we can do. One more, and then we're going to close up. So for me, what should we do as business schools? Business schools serve actually business. And if this is a tsunami coming of, of climate awareness and change, if we think that's going to get bigger, we better help businesses adjust and adapt to it, and also train chief executives and their managers how to keep their businesses alive. So I think we need to be very, very energetic in transforming what we're teaching to allow businesses to learn how to adapt to climate change and learn how to prevent it. And that is, I think, our mandate. So I think that's a great place to end for today because we're just on time. Um, you know, what are the actions for business schools? What are, there are? what are the actions for regulation? For example, cross-border tariffs, um, or you know, we're seeing, for example, carbon adjustment proposals. Tariffs. Um, what are the things we can do to provide benefits to companies to do this? Um, how do we build governance mechanisms that are more likely to have these voices heard? Um, it's a more novel idea, which you'll have to wait till uh, it's published, hopefully in the Harvard Business Review next year. Uh, you know, some of my thoughts about how we would do this. But I think we have to use all of our creative juices as people who study, analyze, support businesses to think about if these are important voices, how do we make sure that they're heard? Also, we do voting. So I hope you found that useful uh, for Bakken. Um, and uh, sadly, no answers here, but <laughs> questions, and that's okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.